Uh, welcome for those of you who are uh, guests. Uh, I've seen a few of you this morning. Uh, some of you came through my office early. Uh, those of you from A&M. Okay, thought I'd get that out of the way. <laughs> and uh, it's a privilege to have the rest of you here as well, as well, as well, as well. Uh, now, seminary is not a perfect place because there's people here, uh, but there are wonderful people who are here. And our student body, uh, every year uh, we get a new uh, crop of students who come through, a new generation of students who come through. Uh, one of the big, greatest blessings at commencement is watching a, a graduating class go, but it's very bittersweet because we'd rather keep them here, but uh, they would rather leave. And, uh, <laughs> So it is a privilege to have you here. Thank you for all in our admissions office and our uh, facilities and plant for the work you do to put a day like this together. Uh, I thank our team and it's a wonderful team with which I get to work. Uh, I wondered about what to do today and I thought uh, maybe I'll just drop you into the middle of what I have been uh, thinking about and, and working on. And uh, I just got back from Israel and uh, one of my sites, the sites that I, I love visiting, is uh, at, at the site of, of Qumran. And so uh, to pull back the curtain a little bit on uh, uh, an ancient manuscript and uh, the Messiah. Some of you never saw that uh, special effect before. <laughs> I gave another presentation yesterday to our faculty and they hadn't, some of them had not seen it. So I just, I just love, love to play with it. So if you're wondering what I've been doing, I've been figuring out transitions and, uh, <laughs> on PowerPoint slide. But uh, I, I want to talk about an ancient manuscript and, uh, and the Messiah, but I want to begin uh, because uh, Cave 12, uh, in the middle of this uh, uh, range right here, has been discovered and announced earlier this year. And uh, it's exciting to uh, find out what's new uh, when we visit the Holy Land and, uh, and see the excavations. One of our grads, Dr. Randy Price, was uh, very instrumental in the excavation. It was a teamed excavation with Liberty University as well as with the Hebrew University and the Department of Antiquities in Israel. And uh, some of the finds that came out of that uh, include uh, some new scrolls. So it's going to be interesting to see when they get translated what contribution Cave 12 makes to the other 11 caves. Uh, and so uh, I, I want to uh, begin, uh, not so much at Qumran, but I want to go across uh, the sea at a site called uh, Makaris. Uh, Makaris. Uh, it's on the east side of the Jordan, and it figures into an account in Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11. And over the last uh, couple of weeks in putting this together, uh, I, I continue to be fascinated with what God does and how he works in his world and how he reveals himself through his word and through his son, Jesus Christ. Matthew chapter 11, verse one, if you have your Bibles. When Jesus had finished giving instructions to his 12 disciples, and in the context of Matthew, that was the ministry to the Jews only, not to the Gentiles and the Samaritans. He said, don't go to the Samaritans, don't go to the Gentiles, go not accept to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. It was that presentation of his ministry through his disciples to Israel. He came unto his own, first and foremost, in order of uh, chronology as well as in terms of an especial appeal uh, to his own people. Uh, and when John, he, he departed from there to teach and preach in their cities. And when John, this is John the baptizer for ye non-Baptists, uh, <laughs> while imprisoned, heard the works of Christ, don't miss that, heard of the works of the Messiah, he sent word by his disciples and he said, are, are you the expected one or should we look for someone else? Uh, the expected one is capitalized in my translation, maybe in yours. It literally in the Greek text is a participle, ha erkamenos, uh, the one coming. Becomes a, a, a technical term for the Messiah. Are, are you the one coming or do we wait for, pursue or wait on a heteron? Hey, heteron, another of a different kind. Are you the one we're expecting, or do we expect for someone else? And Jesus answered and said, uh, go and report to John what you hear and what you see. Now, John is at Makaras. Makaras is across that road, or excuse me, across the sea, uh, at a cone-shaped hill that was built by Alexander Janus and later rebuilt under Herod the Great. 
later bequeathed, so to speak, to uh, Herod Antipas when Herod the Great dies. And uh, they've done excavations on the top of that hill and have discovered a, a pretty ornate palace, uh, not atypical to Herod's uh, megalomania building projects and enjoyment. This was a military outpost to uh, basically guard his interest on the east side of the Dead Sea, uh, though most of his leadership was on the west side. Uh, artists have given us a rendition based on those excavations. It was typical with Roman baths, swimming pools, uh, triclinium uh, court uh, for entertaining guests, etc. And so uh, that, that's where John is, but John finds himself in prison. Uh, he had pointed the finger at Herod, and he said it was not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And so uh, uh, you remember that, uh, that, that she uh, and her daughter connived to get Herod uh, to ultimately kill John the Baptist, but he's not dead yet. He's in uh, uh, prison there across the sea. And, and he says, are you the one coming or, or, or do we look for somebody else? And I think that it's a, a, a normal thought. If you're the press secretary for the president uh, and you find yourself in jail, ready to die, I think a letter back to him that said, I, I thought you were the president, uh, would be a normal and a natural kind of an expectation. And so the question is, what, what was the expectation of the Messiah, and how does that figure in? Uh, I want to take you back to two passages in the Old Testament. Uh, first of all, Isaiah chapter 35, verses 5 and 6, it says, Then, speaking of when the Messiah would come, then the eyes of the blind will be opened, the ears of the deaf will be unstopped, the lame will leap like a deer, the tongue of the mute will shout for joy, for waters will break forth in the wilderness in the streams of the Arava. And then in chapter 61, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, freedom to prisoners, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn. Now in Luke's gospel, as Luke records Jesus' ministry at Nazareth as sort of a paradigmatic uh, opening event of his ministry, Jesus quotes from this passage in the synagogue uh, down through 2a. He does not include the time of vengeance because he had not come, as John says, to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And so he stops short of the judgment message until they respond negatively, and then he sort of intimates that Gentiles have been more receptive than you all, and that upsets, obviously, the synagogue crowd, and they try to kill him. Uh, so Isaiah 61 figures in uh, significantly to uh, the expectation of the Messiah, and when Jesus comes, he quotes this passage as well uh, that uh, inaugurates his ministry, that, that authenticates and inaugurates his ministry. Uh, these two passages form an expectation of the Old Testament. Ironically, between uh, uh, Isaiah's day of 700 BC uh, until you get to Christ, into, in between those two is where the uh, community at Qumran, a, uh, an eschatologically oriented community uh, of separatists who uh, go out in the desert and, uh, and develop a community uh, of, uh, in essence, uh, they viewed themselves as the sons of righteousness versus the sons of wickedness, the sons of light versus the sons of darkness, and, and they viewed themselves as the eschatological community and waiting for the Messiah. So I, I want to back up for a moment because uh, at Qumran, across on the west side, the northwest corner of the sea called the Dead Sea or the Salt Sea, uh, we have the excavations that have been done at Qumran. And uh, at Qumran, uh, along with the, the other sites that are associated with it, uh, up until recently when Cave 12 was announced, uh, the scholars and the excavators have uh, been working on 11 caves of material and they've been cataloging them since 1947 when they were first discovered and they've been translating them, publishing them, talking about them and even arguing about them, which is not a surprise. But uh, across just the ravine, there to your right is uh, Cave 4. And in Cave 4 were discovered some very significant manuscripts. They're not there now, obviously. They're in museums and under glass, etc. But uh, one of those manuscripts, uh, evidence or, or fragments, was 4Q521. I need to tell you a story. Just upstairs, directly above us, is uh, one of our uh, lecture halls. 
And a few years ago, uh, I got introduced to 4Q521 as I was team teaching with our New Testament department in our doctoral program. And I, my responsibility was sort of do a survey of the Qumran discoveries for our doctoral students in the New Testament department. Uh, I had read a little bit about 4Q521, hadn't done anything really with it, but I was excited about it because of the excitement of the scholars about it. And uh, Stephen and Claire Fawn from Jerusalem, who work on the Dead Sea Scroll manuscripts, uh, were uh, lecturing to our Biblical Studies division. And so I waited till the end, and I went down. Uh, we've got a beveled room up there. And I went down to the lecture uh, you know, a bench, and, uh, and Claire was standing there, and others were talking. And so I, I, I went up to Claire, and I said, Claire, uh, I said, tell me a little bit more about 4Q521. And, 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 and oh, like Claire goes like this. She goes, oh. 4Q521, isn't it wonderful? <laughs> and because of the significance of this little scrap of uh, parchment that has been uh, found. Uh, it, it's called, uh, by the scholars, the Messianic Apocalypse. Uh, and uh, that gets argued about, as you might expect. Uh, but uh, conservative uh, uh, theologians and, uh, and biblical experts uh, have translated this. And, and there's a, a section in here that I want you to see highlighted uh, down toward the bottom where it says that he will heal uh, the badly wounded and will make the dead alive and he will proclaim good news to the poor. And basically he's drawing, whoever uh, penned this, they, they were drawing from those same two uh, passages of messianic expectation from Isaiah 35 and Isaiah 61. But I want you to see this because this was the expectation. And so John knows that he is the forerunner. He thought he was the forerunner. And, uh, and, and Jesus has been teaching and doing miracles. And so he sits in prison and he has that question that he wants to ask, are you the expected one or do we look for somebody else? To which Jesus then responds and answered and said to them, Go and report to John. In other words, this is for John to hear. Go tell him what you see, what you hear, and what you see. The words and works that I'm doing. And he quotes, are you ready for this? Isaiah 35 and Isaiah 61. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, and the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel proclaimed to them. And blessed is he who does not take offense at me. Now on the surface, you would say, see, he's quoting the messianic expectation. He's applying it to himself. Uh, voila. But on closer look, there's some fascinating things that are going on here. Because what's included in 4Q521 is a phrase in that section in which he's quoting and, uh, and, and, and linking those two passages. The same two passages, by the way, that Jesus linked and that Judaism had probably linked as well. Now, let me take a caveat. Uh, at the end of Jesus' life, when uh, the Pharisees are trying to trap him, they ask him, what's the highest priority law in the Torah? What, what's the greatest commandment? There were 613, and I think they were waiting for him to talk about one, and they were going to jump on him with the other 612. And Jesus, as you know, outflanks them and says, uh, Deuteronomy 6, 5, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. And this is the first and great commandment, and probably just as they were ready to draw a breath. And he says, and the second one is just like it. Just like it in what way? First and foremost, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two, not one, but two, hang all the law and the prophets. Now, ironically, Jesus is answering that question that way. But if you go back in Luke chapter 10, where you have a rich young man from Israel, when he, Jesus asks him, what does the law say? He linked those two passages already in answer to Jesus. So just like we find throughout the New Testament, where they'll take a quote from here and a quote from here and put those two together because they're a package deal in thought, there, there too, the two great commandments had been linked by Judaism even before, before Jesus reminds them of those two on which all the law and the prophets hang. Here, Isaiah 35 and Isaiah 61 are linked in Qumran 
before Jesus links them together in Matthew chapter 11 and in the parallel of Luke chapter 7. And so, but I want you to see what's here though. In, Luke, in 4Q521, what made uh, Claire excited was this little phrase, and will make the dead live. This is included. Now, why that's important is when you go back, Jesus links this and puts the dead are raised. What Jesus includes is what the Cumramanians included, and I call them that because there's a debate, are they Essenes or are they something else? I'll just call them Cumramanians and stay safe. <laughs> okay, let the scholars continue to debate that. But Jesus includes what the Qumran scroll includes that ironically was omitted, was not included in Isaiah 61, nor Isaiah 35. So what's omitted is another issue. What's omitted in Isaiah 61, excuse me, what's in Isaiah 61 is a little phrase, freedom to prisoners. There's no dead being raised in Isaiah, nor in Isaiah 61 or in Isaiah 35. Okay, that, that these two passages don't talk about Messiah raising the dead, but Qumran when they quoted it did, and Jesus when he quotes that adds it. Now, it may be significant because he, according to Luke's gospel, had just finished raising the widow's son at Nain just prior to that. And so he is saying, go tell John what you've heard and what you've seen, and especially the dead are raised. So what was not in Isaiah 35 and Isaiah 61 is in Qumran and is quoted by Jesus. Now, what's omitted, however, is in Isaiah 61, 1 and 2, the phrase freedom to prisoners is included. But when we go to what's omitted in 4Q521, in that section in which he's quoting, while prisoners are mentioned previously, when he's quoting these two, he leaves out, they leave out freedom for prisoners. So Qumran leaves out what Jesus also leaves out. And so the question is, the issue of freedom to prisoners in that quotation section, and when you come to Jesus, when he answers them, go and report, what's not here is prisoners will be freed. Doesn't mean they won't be, but he's asking and answering a question, or answering a question that's been asked, and telling them to go tell John what you see and what you hear. Now the question is, why would he include what Qumran included, and why would he exclude what Qumran excluded? The scholars are divided, as you might expect. But remember, John was a, uh, a Bible thumper. Uh, John the Baptist uh, was in the wilderness, separate from the uh, Aaronic priesthood that was operating in Jerusalem. Uh, he was in the desert. He dressed like Elijah. He preached like Elijah. He ate like Elijah. He probably smelled like Elijah. <laughs> and it's hard not to think that in the Qumran community, or what was left of it at the time of Christ, that there wouldn't have been contact uh, with them, especially in that region of the wilderness near the Dead Sea. Uh, some would even argue that Jesus must have had contact as well. But whatever the issue, uh, one of the ironies is the Qumran expectation was a Messiah that would uh, raise the dead, but in a quote from Isaiah, in Isaiah 35 and 61, where the prisoners are freed, is mentioned, they left it out, and so did he. It's just an interesting observation, but we might ask the question, why? Where is John, and what's going on? John is in prison. He's not going to be let out. He is going to die. So here is the Lord of the universe, sending a message back to his forerunner. I want him to know that even if he dies in prison at the hands of Herod, he'll live again because I can raise the dead. Would that have been an encouragement or what? It is throughout the New Testament, the hope, and we'll celebrate that a week from Sunday. Because he lives, we too shall live. Ironically, in Luke's gospel, you have the announcement of Jesus, or John's birth, and then the announcement of Jesus' birth. 
You have the birth of John and then the birth of Jesus. Then you have the ministry of John and the ministry of Jesus. And both will die with a Herod pronouncing a sentence upon them. The forerunner in many ways. The prophet of the Most High who introduces the Son of the Most High. And there's parallel experiences that they will have. He won't get out of prison. So there's no need to sort of put that one in his face. Oh yeah, the prisoners are going to be freed. Me? No. So I think in the gentleness of Jesus, in the wisdom of Jesus, and the more I study the life of Jesus, the more genius he becomes. Is he gives John comfort. If you're going to die at the hands of Herod, I can take care of that. But you're not going to get out of prison. Others might, but you won't. So rather than throwing that one in his face and putting that one in front of him, which he could have been quoting from Isaiah 35 or Isaiah 61, he doesn't. What's included and what's omitted fits the occasion. It also says all kinds of things. Now, lest you think bad of John, he goes on to say this. And as these men were going away, Jesus began to speak to the crowd and, 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 and about John. Lest you think bad about John, he says, what did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? It's a rhetorical question. Uh uh But what did you go out to see? A man dressed in fine clothes? Those who wear soft clothing are in king's palaces. What did you go out to see? Uh, you went out to see a prophet. Yes, I tell you, one who is more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it is written, and Jesus links him back, as John had linked his own ministry back, to Isaiah chapter 40. Behold, I send my me messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way before you. He's the voice calling in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, and uh, linking it probably to the Malachi 3 and Malachi 4 expectation as well. And then he says this, Truly I say to you, among those born of women, there is not arisen anyone greater than John the Baptist. In the era of the prophets, he's the greatest. Nobody else, including all of us in here, have been filled with the Spirit before we were born. But you remember that he was filled with the Spirit while yet in Elizabeth's womb. And when Mary visits Elizabeth, uh, the baby leaps in her womb for joy because the mother of the Lord is present. And you have, interesting enough, you have emotion, you have life, you have filled with the Spirit, says something about the right to life and when life can start. But that's another whole topic. But the one who is least in the kingdom is greater than he. Of the prophetic era, he's the greatest. But in the kingdom era, a person who finds themselves born again and in the place of God's kingdom. He's not saying John isn't. What he's saying is compared to those of humanity versus those born of the Spirit, the least in the, in the, in the kingdom born by the Spirit, is greater than the best of those born in humanity. So whatever you think of John, it's more important in one sense that you understand what does it mean to be a part of God's kingdom. He says, from the days of John the Baptist until now the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and violent men take it by force. For all the prophets in the law prophesied until John, and if you're willing to accept it, John himself is Elijah who is to come. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. That one just raises all kinds of questions. Because when John was asked, are you the Elijah? He said, no. But Jesus said, he's Elijah if you could handle it. Now, there was Elijah the Tishbite who went to heaven without dying. Malachi 4, 5, and 6, uh, other verses in the Hebrew Bible, but in, in the English Bible, Malachi 4, 5, and 6 says, uh, Behold, uh, Elijah the prophet will come before the great and terrible day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is going to be great and terrible. Great for some, terrible for others. Uh, it's going to be a phenomenal day when God acts on, uh, on earth on behalf of his will and his plan. So he promises a, an Elijah the prophet. When John shows up, John, are you, the, are you Elijah? He goes, no. Jesus said he is if you can handle it. And that creates another conversation. But let me stop here and ask, why is this so important? Why do we spend the time here? Because in New Testament studies and biblical studies, in opposition to the views of the critical scholars against early Christianity, that there was no messianic consciousness uh, uh, of Jesus, that that was something later that the church overlaid upon the history of Jesus, Jesus indeed saw himself as the Messiah. What he's doing, go show John 
what you've seen and what you've heard. And he links by quotation of the Old Testament, and even if I can say this, by the Qumranian expectation, he links himself to being that messianic figure. That's huge in the history of, uh, of, of Jesus. Number two, according to Matthew 11, Matthew affirms John heard about the works of, don't miss it in the text, the Christ, the Christ. And so Matthew tells you that John knew of the works of Messiah, wondered about him. Are you the Messiah that we expected? Is there another one? But he understood the works of what Messiah would do. And when Matthew records this for an early church audience, he links his own idea and John's idea that these are the works of the Messiah. Number three, when Jesus claims what Jesus claims in this passage is the authority and the ability to do that which scripture affirms only Yahweh can do. He links himself with the very power and person of God himself. His claim to deity is a match to his claim to messiahship. So this becomes absolutely important. But let me take you on a quick little survey. Matthew chapter 17, six days later, and this is after he had announced that he was going to the cross and the revelation of the church at Caesarea Philippi, he took him up, Peter, James, and John, and his brother, led them up on a high mountain by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. And his face shone like the sun, and his garments became white as light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with them. Now Luke tells us they were talking about the exodus, the akadas, the exodus that he would fulfill in Jerusalem. And Peter says to him, Lord, it's good for us to be here. <laughs> Probably an understatement. If you wish, I'll make three tabernacles here, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. You got to hand it to him. He didn't say, and one for me. <laughs> now, what is Peter thinking? Probably, if you have representatives of the law and the prophets, and you have the Messiah here in his glorified form, in that transfigured form, and you have the disciples here, this has got to be kingdom presence. And so what would be celebrated, according to Zechariah 14, when Messiah does come, would be a perpetual feast of tabernacles. And so... Uh, while he was speaking, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud said, This is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell down with their face on the ground and were terrified. And Jesus came to them and touched them and said, Get up and do not be afraid. And lifting up their eyes, they saw no one except Jesus alone. That transfiguration was momentarily. Uh, Matthew's gospel helps us. He says that they were coming down from the mountain. He commanded them, tell the vision to no one. He gives us this, this apocalyptic or this prophetic vision is what was their experience. Jesus in his glorified state. Uh, Elijah and Moses in their presence. Talking about what God would do through Christ at Jerusalem. And then they're all gone. And Jesus is back probably to his uh, uh, normal appearance as a human being without the glory in terms of the covering. And he says, tell the vision to no one until the Son of Man is risen from the dead. That's where it culminates. And his disciples ask him, why then do the disciples, the scribes say that Elijah must come first? And he answered and said, Elijah is coming. Notice that future Elijah is coming and will restore all things. But I say to you that Elijah already came and they did not recognize him, but did to him whatever they wished. So also the Son of Man is gonna suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he had spoken to them about John the Baptist. And you go, wait a minute. There's Elijah the Tishbite. There's Elijah expected in Malachi. John the Baptist was Elijah if you could handle it, but an Elijah is coming. How many Elijahs are there? <laughs> and it's probably a term for an office. Because ironically, there's another Elijah coming when there's the restoration of all things. So here, are you ready for a blitzkrieg? The Old Testament expectation was Elijah would precede Messiah who would set up his kingdom. I call it an EMK expectation. Elijah the prophet would precede the Messiah. He'd be the forerunner of the Messiah who would then set up the kingdom. Uh, in Jewish eschatology, they viewed this age in contrast to the age to come. This is the age of prophecy. The age to come is the time of the fulfillment of the kingdom. What was a mystery, as the New Testament reveals, was that when Christ came, he came the first time, and Israel said no. The expectation of, of all of them was that when he came, he would judge the nations and restore the kingdom to Israel. That was the question the disciples kept asking all the way till the time of the ascension. That was the Old Testament expectation. 
that he would judge the world and he would establish uh, the, the tent of, of David like it used to be, according to Amos. But what happened was they said no. And though Jesus, when he gives the divine comment, he says, how often I wanted to gather you as a mother hen would gather her chickens, but you would not have it. Therefore, your house is left to you desolate. And you won't see me till you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, speaking of his second advent, as we now know it. So the question is, what happened to the EMK expectation? There was an Elijah, if you could handle him, who did rightfully introduce the Messiah, who said the kingdom is, is near. Uh, the disciples said the kingdom is near. Jesus said the kingdom is near. But they said no. So the question is, what happened to the kingdom? And what we get introduced in the New Testament, in the Gospels, in the rest of the New Testament, is an inter-advent period of God's kingdom program on earth. It's introduced by a phrase called the mysteries of the kingdom, as revealed especially in the parables. And so during this period of time, we're in a mystery phase of God's kingdom program, as I would term it. And ironically, uh, your house is left to you desolate. There's judgment on Israel while God expands the message of salvation to the Gentiles. And that's Romans 9, 10, and 11 in a nutshell. The question is, what will happen in the future? There will be an Elijah who will come. In fact, one of the two witnesses in Revelation chapter 11 will have the power to call down fire from heaven, just like Elijah did. Is he Elijah? I don't know. I didn't think John the Baptist was, but Jesus did, if you could handle it. <laughs> so I think there's going to be an Elijah who will precede Messiah, who will ultimately establish his kingdom. And yes, as the New Testament tells us, there will be the judgment of the nations. There will be a restoration of ethnic Israel, we believe, in the future. So where does that put us? We are a mystery within a mystery. We are the church, who find ourselves in between the two advents of Christ, looking back with great faith on what he did with us at his first coming, and with great expectation as we look forward to him at his second coming. Every time we take communion, we proclaim the Lord's death when? Until he comes. Because he said, I'm not going to celebrate this with you again until I do it in the kingdom. So we expect his coming. We expect his kingdom. And the prayer is, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is big picture. It's with big picture perspective that Jesus wanted to encourage John. Even if you die, it's going to be okay. Even if you go to prison and you don't get out, it'll still be okay. And as we think about our brothers and sisters, some of whom I know in uh, Syria today, those two th truths are still abiding truths. And whatever happens to us in our generation and whatever happens around our world, to our brothers and sisters, many of whom today will give their lives for Christ because they dared preach righteousness as represented in the gospel of Jesus Christ. If they go to jail, they may not get out. Even if they die, there's a life to come. That kind of perspective John needed. The big picture perspective is what I continue to need. So this is something I've just been working on the last couple of weeks and wanted you to know. I'm more excited about my Bible study now than ever before in my life. So when you look at the Qumran scrolls and you see 5Q, which means, or excuse me, 4Q, which means fourth cave of Qumran, 521 is the number of the manuscripts. And you hear 4Q, 521, just do this. All right. <laughs> Isn't it wonderful? And the answer is, it is. Let's pray. Father, for the way your son worked, in great compassion and yet great truthfulness, with great conviction and great dexterity, we're grateful. Thank you for his ministry, even to his forerunner, in which he encourages faith and said, blessed is he who doesn't stumble over me. Lord, we need that in our culture. We've got a lot of people stumbling over the claims of Christ who thought they thought he was the Messiah, but wonder, may your word be that solid hitching posts for our lives that we stay tethered to so that we can stay connected to your truth and live life regardless of what comes. As was prayed earlier by Nate, be with our brothers and sisters in Syria, the families of refugees who are fleeing, 
those who were the targets intended or unattended of the gas attacks? Would you use the instability of the region to bring the stability of the message of Jesus as never before? And we pray for a phenomenal outreach in the Middle East. Be with those who minister of our graduates in Lebanon who are ministering to Syrians, refugees like um, uh, Malad Dagar, for Ahmad Shahada and his ministry at Jets in Jordan, others in that region. Lord, for the alums who serve in 101 countries of our world, in every time zone, opening your word, proclaiming your truth, knowing it works even today, we ask that you would bless them, protect them, encourage them. Be with these students who are wondering whether they should come to DTS. Uh, we would say yes, but we'd want you to say yes, and that they'd follow your direction wherever you lead them. May they discover the next steps for their lives from you through uh, their time here and others in counsel and prayer, and uh, bathing themselves in your word, we pray, and we'll give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen.